So I'm Mike Dorsch. Uh, I'm a pharmacist and uh, researcher at the College of Pharmacy. Most of my work um, revolves around digital health um, and visual health interventions. Um, and so that's what I'm here today to talk about is some of the work we're doing with just-in-time adaptive interventions, also known as JEDIs. Um, as you can tell by the picture, um, it's pronounced JEDIs. Um, and uh, it, it, if any of you are Star Wars fans, you know that I picked the old um, or the original uh, Jedi picture, not the new one on purpose. Um, all right, so today we're going to talk about uh, Jedis, discuss what they are, um, describe a, uh, one example from my research, but um, throughout I'll kind of like dabble in other examples that you may have heard of. And then we're going to discuss, um, Jesse Golbus is actually going to discuss like randomized trials and how that fits into um, the Jedi intervention framework and describe an example um, in her work of uh, an MRT. So I'm gonna start with two lenses that I come to this research with. And um, the reason I use these two lenses is because um, sometimes when you talk about Jedis or I hear people talk about Jedis, it's hard to get back to the patient and how that's important to a, an individual patient um, because there's a lot of technology and there's a lot of like mobile applications, push notifications, wearables, all that kind of stuff that get involved. So um, I thought I'd start with the precision health, precision health lens that I come to this with. So if you've ever done precision health talk or seen a precision health talk, there's always the glacier sort of analogy where the patient, you know, from a healthcare standpoint, we only see a little bit of the patient, the rest of the patient is kind of under the water. And, um, you know, we want to know more about the patient, right? And, and get more information about the patient. And so there's a bunch of things that we don't obviously get every time someone has an interaction with the healthcare system. There's all the omics that some are available, but most are not. There's some of the social information, um, psychological information from a patient, their physical state, um, their environment that's around them, um, and then potentially their lifestyle. And, and so many of you who work in M Health are in this space already and trying to collect data in the space um, because you can use EMAs, which is an example I think that's been presented at, at DigitMI before and other ways with wearables to get at some of these things that, that happen every day in a patient's life but doesn't bubble up to uh, being in an EHR, for example. The other lens that I come to this with is that mHealth or JEDIs are patient-centered clinical decision support that's maybe a new concept for some of you, but if you think about clinical decision support, everybody in healthcare thinks about an EHR and someone getting a, put, a notification in the EHR of a patient that needs a flu shot or needs something uh, done for them. I think of M Health apps for patients that they download on their phone or JEDIs that they might download on their phone as a patient-centered clinical decision support. It's giving them the right information um, to the right person at the right time in the right format. OK, um, and so I think that's really an important lens to think about because there's a bunch of literature in the clinical decision support world about how those things might work. Um, and so we can use that in, in this research. All right, so what are JEDIs? Um, JEDIs are intervention design, are an intervention design. Um, that's, that's really important. It's not an analytic technique, but an intervention design. Um, the intervention usually in some format senses a user state or context. This is usually where your hypothesis comes in. So you would hypothesize that a patient might be in a vulnerable state um, and you would provide an intervention during that vulnerable state. So an example might be if every Tuesday night, this specific uh, participant or user goes to the bar and drinks, and we know that, right? And they go after work to the bar and drink with their friends. If you want them to reduce their alcohol intake, you might give them an intervention at that time, but you have to be able to sense that and understand their state and their context in order to be able to uh, provide that intervention. So once you know the information that you um, obtain from a user, then you intervene in real time um, in their everyday life. This is mostly done through mobile apps. Uh, you know, you could probably think of a bunch of other examples, you know, like ones like Facebook, for example, or Twitter or other places that you might be able to use data from, from those to provide an, a potential intervention just in time but mostly done through mobile applications, or at least that's the examples that I'll give. 
The intervention is usually a push notification or some sort of thing that goes to their phone. There's some people that are doing S SMS, um, but a lot of times it's done through the push notification because you need to have some uh, technology on their device to be able to sense some of these states. Plus or minus into in-app content. So if they tap on the notification, they get content in an app and that might help them make a decision. And then the adaptive part would be um, the sensing. So them sensing um, or the, the app or whatever technology you're using, sensing their context or their state, the text that is in the notification. So that can be adaptive. So it, it could adapt over time and change over time. It could be based on some baseline characteristics you know about that person, or it could be as simple as knowing their name. So the, the push notification could have their name in it and be more personalized. And then the last is the adaptive part could be the in-app content could be very customized to the individual or where they're at and what they're doing. Just to give you some other key elements to Jedi, um, and I, I have a nice picture to because it's, sometimes it's hard with the text to, to really grasp this, but um, the, the process is really composed of tailoring variables, decision rules, um, and then some, some intervention options because you can have a bunch of different options for the intervention. Um, and you, the, the key thing is there has to be a decision point um, that where it gets triggered. So you have to say trigger at this time um, and that's implemented. And so this is, um, I saw somebody from the D3C group on uh, the call. This is an example they give on their website. Um, they have some really great resources for Jedi's. Um, but let's say every two hours, the app just checks and sees if the user has a negative affect. And if they do have a negative affect, or the presence of other smokers. So you know that they're in the presence of other smokers. Either one of those is true and they're not driving, right? Because we don't want to send them a push notification when they're driving. Um, then the intervention could be the prompt, could send them a, a push notification. But if that's not true, then else the intervention would be nothing. Okay. So it's a simple decision rule that would get run over and over again. So this example will be every two hours. So I'm going to give you an example from my research, um, one that, that we use, um, an app that's currently studying um, is to help with sodium intake. So um, I don't know if I have to go over it too much, but like sodium intake is too much in the United States. We have most of our sodium intake comes from uh, food that we buy in, in grocery stores or retail stores and in restaurants. Um, very little comes from uh, home cooking or at the table. Um, and so um, our hypothesis was, could we create intervention at, at restaurants and grocery stores. So we created a just-in-time redemptive intervention um, named Losol for Life. It's a mobile application um, where we use some sensors on the phone to, to understand a user's context um, and alert them at grocery stores and restaurants. Um, at, at restaurants, we give them low-sodium alternative foods that they could eat. And then they can also go into the restaurant's menu and see what uh, items might be lower in sodium. And then at grocery stores, they can scan items. Um, when they scan an item, it, it also shows them lower sodium items for those that are um, higher in sodium. And I'll give you, a, I have a picture of this in a minute. Notifications are tailored to the patient based on some uh, baseline surveys that they do in, in the study. Um, and the in-app content is adapted to the user's location or the item, depending on which, you know, whether they're in a restaurant or whether they're in a grocery store. So, we take nutrition data, we take location pattern or other contextual information about a, a person, and we we provide them push notifications at restaurants and grocery stores. For nutrition data, we use a, a large database that's called Nutritionix. It's it's one of the larger ones that's out there that pretty much covers you know the majority of North America, um, essentially for all restaurants, uh, major restaurant chains, and, and grocery stores. It covers you know almost a million branded grocery store products. Um, it's so big, you, Google uses it. So if you, not many people use this anymore, but if you use the main page for Google and you search an item, it'll show Nutritionix on the right as it, after it searches, there's a, a spot on the right. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty big um, database. And then for location and pattern data, we use a, um, a third party um, service called Number 8, um, which essentially just monitors the phone um, sensors and then has a on-device um, algorithm um, that can predict different types of events. Um, there's a bunch of companies in this space, as you can imagine. Um, anytime you bring up 
uh, car insurance. Um, you can almost bet that car insurance companies are using some sort of third party company like this to, to get information. Um, that's how you might get a discount on your car insurance. Or if you hear of a, uh, thing that you, you have to download an app and you get a better rate in your car insurance. Well, the app probably has some company like this implemented some service like this implemented in their app. Um, and so we use this app to, to, to find out when people are at grocery stores or restaurants, and then we provide them with that, uh, intervention. Just to give you an understanding of the glimpses that we get of these patients and how you customize you can get. So this is, a, this is from our database. Um, none of this is identifiable data for an individual in our study, but it is an individual in our study. It actually might be me. I can't remember. It might actually be me, but um, you can see that we get back a bunch of information about the phone, right? So like this is, uh, the phone is on and it's faced up. Um, the person is stationary. They're at their house. They're working. And it's breakfast or weekend time. And outside it's it's freezing and clear. You can tell this is Michigan because it's March 28th and it's freezing outside. <laughs> um, an example of someone that would be going to a restaurant would look like this. So they might be in their vehicle, they might be have the device in their hand pointed up. Um, you can tell that they're, well, it says they're in their vehicle, they're indoor, maybe they're in a line at a McDonald's or something. Um, it tells us that it's a food and drink place, it's a restaurant, they're traveling and it's before lunch and it's cold and cloudy. So you can see how you could tailor some information here. You can provide a push notification at a restaurant. You could tailor it to it being a weekend day based on the, the actual text itself could say something about the weekend um, or it could say something about the weather um, depending on what your intervention might be. So just to give you a picture of this, um, this is a person coming to maybe a McDonald's or some other restaurant. What do I want to eat? And then based on some location data around that, that um, place, we would kind of push a notification to them. So don't worry, you can eat out and still watch your sodium. And then when they tap on that notification, it goes right into our app and we give them low sodium alternative meals that they can eat. And then they could tap in and, and see the actual restaurant menu items. To see something similar for a grocery store, um, when they scan an item, we tell them if it's a good item or not. And if it's a bad item, like I said, right below that, we'll have low, lower sodium alternatives, green and, and yellow. So we use a green, yellow, red sort of um, moniker to, to help them out. We did a pilot study here. Um, uh, this was from 2016 to 2018. Um, looking at our app in 50 patients. So they're randomized one-to-one -to, -one, um, to our app versus control. Um, we measured some urinary measures of, of sodium intake and we measured some um, uh, survey data, um, sort of subjective and objective data of um, their sodium intake. Um, and um, from baseline to eight weeks, we saw, a, you know, app versus no app, the majority of patients that were in the app group saw an improvement in their sodium intake, whether you're looking at more objective signs like urine um, studies or subjective signs of uh, surveys like a food frequency questionnaire or dietary recall, we saw a benefit um, with the app. Um, the other thing we saw that was interesting was that we did see a reduction in systolic blood pressure over time um, in the group that got the app, so it was lower. Um, whereas the app group kind of stayed the same throughout the study, eight weeks of the study. And so um, we're currently now doing a large study. We're almost halfway through a 400 patient um, randomized controlled trial at Michigan with the app versus control. So in conclusion, I think I'm hitting time here perfectly. Um, we using mobile apps, you know, you have this ca capability to, to get information um, from the apps, um, from the um, all the sensors and things that are on the app, and that can have significant promise for precision health. Um, JEDIs are digital health intervention delivery frameworks that can be effective at helping patients at the time when they need that help. And then uh, the example I gave was low salt for life, um, uh, you know, so that you can get a sense of how JEDIs could be used in the real world. And now I'll pass it over to Jessie so that she can share her screen and talk about MRTs. Great. Okay. Are you guys seeing the right? Ooh, probably nothing there. Let's see. Okay. 
Great. Are you guys seeing the right screen? Perfect. Okay. Um, so um glad to be here. I'm Jesse Goldbus. I am a heart failure cardiologist here, and my research focuses on how we can use mobile health technology for behavioral modification in patients with cardiovascular disease. So my biggest disclosure for today is that my internet is a disaster and um, keeps going out um, when the VPN disconnects. But I promise if I uh, disappear, I will be back shortly. So that is probably my most important disclosure. These are the other disclosures for this work. Um, so um, I'm going to be talking about the Valentine study, which was funded by a number of um, internal grants here, um, as well as the um, uh, American Heart Association. Um, so um, just to kind of give you some background on micro randomized trials. Um, so uh, I really like this definition, but it's an experimental design to aid in constructing empirically based just in time adaptive interventions through the serial randomization of participants to different types of interventions and or different levels of an intervention. So the idea is that you can use micro randomized trials to decide whether to include a time varying component in a multi-component intervention or to determine in which context the component of an intervention is most effective. Now, importantly, these are not confirmatory studies to evaluate an intervention package. They're ident identifying parts of an intervention and then using that to construct an optimally um, constructed intervention package, which then you can test in a JEDI. Um, so, I, you know, Mike really kind of walked you through a lot of this already. So some of this is redundant, um, but I, I think that this is really important. Um, uh, so I'll just walk you through this one more time. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a kind of a traditional figure that you'll see when whenever you hear somebody talking about, hear somebody talking about an MRT or a JEDI. Um, so, so micro randomization, it's the process of serially randomizing someone to one or several components of an intervention. And there, it's not different than any other type of randomized trial, except for the time scale over which it's operating. That's kind of really important to understand. So the same person can be randomized multiple times per day, hourly, for example, and it just, just depends on, on the behavior that you're trying to intervene upon. So um, individuals are um, randomized at decision points. Decision points are guided by tailoring variables, which are individual level contextual characteristics, which are used to determine when a participant is most likely to benefit from an intervention component. So in a micro-randomized trial with multiple intervention components, each intervention component will be associated with its own decision points and decision rules that operationalize intervention de delivery. And at each decision point, participants are randomized to levels of an intervention component or to receive or not receive the intervention. Now, when provided, these interventions are typically delivered through push notifications. Mike gave you a nice example of that in Low Salt for Life. And then you can assess the effectiveness of an intervention through something called the proximal outcome. So this is a short uh, term intermediate um, effect um, that is thought to mediate your more desired distal outcome. So for example, a physical activity intervention, your proximal outcome might be step count in the 60 minutes after um, an intervention. So this is the type of study questions that you can use um, that a micro-randomized trial can help you, help you to answer. So does an intervention component impact its intended or short-term proximal outcome? How is the effect of an inter interaction component impacted by other intervention components? Is treatment effectiveness context dependent? How does the effect of an intervention component change over time? And how frequently should an intervention component be delivered? And you'll see when these slides get sent out, if not here, there are some examples of um, you know, what this could look like, um, particularly in the cardiovascular space. 
So to give you now a concrete example, this is from the Valentine study. So uh, the Valentine study was a prospective randomized control trial designed to evaluate a just-in-time adaptive intervention to augment and extend the benefits of cardiac rehabilitation. So the study integrated a mobile application with physiologic and contextual information from wearable devices. And the study was completely remote, and we launched it, in fact, shortly after the, the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic back in 2020. So following completion of virtual consent enrollment visits, participants were randomized to the control arm of the study or to the intervention arm in which they got the Valentine intervention. And both groups, importantly, got the smartwatch and usual cardiac rehabilitation care. And then we followed participants for six months for the remote endpoint of six minute walk distance. So the core of an inter intervention was this just-in-time adaptive intervention with notifications micro-randomized. So participants received two types of notifications. So the first were activity messages. These were designed to be actionable in real time and promoted low-level physical activity appropriate for someone's current environment. So things like walking, for example. And these notifications were tailored based on passively collected variables, such as the weather, the time of day, the day of week, and where participants were relative to starting cardiac rehabilitation. The second type of intervention was based on these exercise notifications. And exercise, unlike physical activity, is a planned behavior. So rather than telling somebody to go and exercise right now, we encourage participants to plan their exercise for the next day and suggested new activities to increase participants' exercise repertoires. And these types of notifications were tailored based on the season or phase of cardiac rehabilitation. So to give you an example of what this could look like, the notification on the left was um, a notification that was sent to a 64-year-old female on a sunny weekend day about two months after she had started cardiac rehabilitation for a heart attack. So our two proximal outcomes, they were different for the two types of messages. So for the activity messages, which were meant to be actionable in real time, we looked at step count 60 minutes after a text message as measured by the smartwatch. And then for the exercise planning messages, we looked at the subsequent days, exercise minutes, again, measured by the smartwatch. In addition to receiving these text messages, intervention participants also had access to a mobile application, which was paired with their smartwatch. So this allowed for self-monitoring of activity data, allowed participants to set and complete activity goals, and then it could allow them to adjust those goals based on their performance. So... Interestingly, or I, I think, um, you know, one of the decisions we had to make was, was we decided to use two types of smartwatches. And we, um, uh, our rationale at the time had been a lot of studies were being done back in 2020, limiting participants to those that owned a particular type of smartphone. And so we decided that we wanted an inclusive design and we wanted to be able to give participants different types of smartwatches. So Apple Watch users, got, or our iPhone users got an Apple Watch and Android users got a Fitbit. And a priori, we anticipated significant heterogeneity by device type given measurement differences. And so we created separate models for both Apple Watch and Fitbit users. And we had moderated treatment effects over three time periods that correlated with clinical periods relative to when they started cardiac rehabilitation. And we created these device-specific models that evaluated the effect of delivering a text message versus no text message at each of decision point on the subsequent days, six, on the subsequent 60-minute step count. Um, this is for here, the, the physical activity notifications. We adjusted for a number of treatment effects. And um, importantly, we defined um, uh, availability, it's supposed to say post hoc instead of post doc. Um, um, 
uh, by you know requiring that they wear their that their smartwatch be were worn at the time that a notification was delivered. So this is different a little bit than maybe what Mike was telling you about, and that we did were not able to know in real time whether participants were or were not um, wearing their watches. Um, and wearing the watch was a condition for measuring the outcome. Um, and so we consider participants in our analysis available to receive the intervention um, only if they were um, wearing their smartwatch um, at, at the time. And so we opera operationalize this by requiring that they have at least one heart rate measurement in the 30 minutes prior to a decision point. So this is um, the, the trial in total enrolled 220 participants. This is for the intervention arm of the study, um, which received the micro randomized intervention. So between October 23rd, 2020 and March 25th, 2022, 112 participants were randomized to the intervention arm of the study. Uh, these were some of their baseline characteristics. They were about 60 years of age, about a third were female, um, and about two thirds of our participants had an iPhone and were provided with an Apple Watch. Um, importantly, um, baseline step count for this um, group of participants was about 7,500 steps a day for both um, Apple Watch and Fitbit users, which demonstrates that this was a relatively healthy cohort. Uh, so we had outstanding uh, compliance. Um, participants wore their watches for a median of 180 of a possible 182 days. 88% of participants wore their watches for at least three quarters of study days. And participants generated an impressive 70,552 randomizations. So over 70,000 decision points. And this led to, on average, participants getting about one text message per day, um, so 0.91. And they were available for um, to receive 0.8 activity messages per day, meaning that in some instances the message was sent, but they weren't wearing their watch, and then we were therefore unable to determine the effect of that intervention. So you'll see here um, our results. Uh, this is based on uh, data that's still um, under, um, the manuscript for this is still under review. Um, but um, you'll see Apple Watch users here in blue uh, and Fitbit users in yellow. Um, and I just want to call out, um, she's no longer at the university, but one of the uh, postdocs, Harris She, who did this analysis and, and, and did a really wonderful job. Um, so as you can see, amongst Apple Watch users, again, there in blue, during the initiation phase of the study, which was the first 30 days, delivering a text message increased 60 minutes step count by 10% that really just missed statistical significance. Messages did not significantly impact 60 minute step count during that middle maintenance phase of the study, but was associated with a significant 6% increase in step count during the completion phase of the study. Now, turning to Fitbit users in yellow, we saw a significant 17% increase in user step count during the initial phase of the study, but that subsequently decremented over time. So again, importantly, in both groups, we saw a very early effect from, no from notifications um, and then variable impact in, in the maintenance and longitudinal phases of the study. So turning to some challenges and lessons learned. Um, so, you know, I, I think some of the in innovation from this study was this remote recruitment and enrollment pipeline. Um, some other studies have done that now, um, although at the time back in 2020, I think that this was um, fairly innovative as it was the start of the pandemic. Um, there have not been a lot of micro randomized trials in the cardiovascular disease space. So there's been a lot of work um, that's done in mental health and addiction, um, but I think very few micro randomized trials in patients that have cardio have um, existing or prevalent cardiovascular disease. And then we followed participants for six months, um, which is um, longer than than many of the the MRTs or JEDIs to date. 
Uh, I think some of you have heard me give this talk or similar variations on it, um, but we have um, important lessons learned and I'll, I'll just share some of these again here because I, I do think that they're really important. Um, first, um, uh, people have to open the mobile application for their data to sync. Um, I think this is important when you think about studies with have control groups, um, because this is a group that has much less of an impetus to use the mobile application, and therefore you're, you know, you're, you may not be able to get their data quite as easily. Um, and second, I, for a lot of these mobile health trials, while automated reminders are helpful, text messages reminding people to wear their watch, for example, there's really still, I think, no substitute for a phone call from a study team member. Um, and so that was something that we have continued to include in our studies. This is not unique to JEDIs or MRTs, um, but I think something important for these mobile health studies in general. Um, there was... Um, uh, some um, important, I think, lessons learned from a study design and analytic perspective. Um, we had fairly limited contextual tailoring. I think this is one of the most important lessons that I've learned from this study. Um, the, um, you know, we, we had a concern when we first started the study that people would, would worry that if we were tailoring too much, that we were kind of infringing upon their privacy. And I think one of the things that we've learned, um, both from the uh, analysis of this data that I've shown you, but also just from um, some um, interviews that we've done, did with participants at the end of the study, that people want actually more contextual tailoring. I think people felt like they're giving up their data and, and in response, they kind of wanted the most tailoring possible. Um, and I think one of the ones that they, they particularly wanted tailoring on was their recent physical activity levels. Um, uh, I'll skip kind of the next one, but but um, in the interest of time, but we were unable to confirm um, whether messages um, were received or read, which I think is important. So we could tell whether they were sent, but we couldn't we couldn't determine if they were received or read or specifically the time that they were received or read. So for example, a notification could have been read three hours after it was sent. Um, but, um, we assumed, um, you know, that, that notifications were delivered and read, um, at the time that they were sent. And so obviously that has implications for the analysis. Um, and, and finally, um, you know, thinking about where time, this applies again, less the MRT and JEDIs, um, but I, I think it's something interesting. Um, I'll, I'll kind of skip over this one in the interest of time. So we have enough time for questions, um, uh, so um, with that, um, this is my contact information um, and happy to take any questions you have related to um, JEDIs or MRTs, um, either now in the questions or, or later as they come up. Thank you both happy so much. I made that through that without my internet going out. So <laughs> that was a success. <laughs> That is a success. There were a couple of questions that came up um, in the chat for Mike um, that I'll just read in case anyone mess, missed them. Um, have you ever thought about doing a JITA intervention with AI chat tools? Would that be less effective than a custom app? And so Mike's response was they haven't used any type of tools, um, but it that might be good at tailoring, writing tailored text. Um, and then I asked about who the developer was for the low salt for life, and that was an internal development team. But I would love to open it up to questions from others. I have a question. Um, these tools seem like really cool. And one thing I wondered if you'd had any feedback from the participants that you just seem to know too much about them and where they are and, and what they're doing, um, especially knowing, you know, their location, if they're in a restaurant, for instance. Um, did you get any sort of negative feedback about it being like a little bit too invasive in both of these studies? We We haven't gotten much back about how invasive it is. I think that, um, I think some of it's generational, right? Depending on where right. where you are and your you know affinity to technology. 
Um, I think there's also this sort of implicit like exchange of things. Like if, like, for example, if you use Facebook, right? you're getting a free service to connect with your family and to see your cousins, kids, and all that kind of stuff with the knowledge, whether you will admit it or not, that Facebook is using all of your information to create large algorithms to provide better information to you um, when you're around the system. And so what we have kind of thought is like, if you can do that for good, if you can take something like diet or physical activity or something else and and do this sort of thing for good that people would be willing to say okay you know as long as you're doing it in the right way right so like our algorithm that we use from this third party is an on-device algorithm doesn't send data outside of the app that's identifiable at all um and so as long as you do it in a way and you explain it to people that way i i think people are receptive to it yeah um yeah i would agree um with Mike. Um, so we did interviews with um, about 25 people that finished the study um, in, in kind of a, you know, a, a structured manner. Um, and, you know, the feedback was kind of consistently, they feel like their data is out there. Um, and, and so they, they want to feel like there's a return on their investment. Um, so uh, they they wanted so I, I think we were actually fairly general. Um, one, we worried about kind of this concern that we were infringing on people's privacy. Um, we we did use their name in about some of the text in about half the text messages, but you know the weather, time of day, like that, that's kind of fairly general um, as opposed to saying you walked seven thousand steps yesterday, you know. Um, but but. Um, so, so we, we, one, were worried about infringing on people's privacy and, and kind of two, we were worried if we could kind of be good enough. Like this was one of our first MRTs. And so we were worried more about like, how would it impact people's trust in the intervention if we delivered a notification that was incorrectly tailored? Um, and I, I think most people came back to us and said like, they wanted more, like their data is out there. They want more tailoring. It didn't really bother them for the times that they were like mistailored the notifications. They were like, you know, sometimes it was less about the content content. It was more just like the notification was there. It reminded me of the importance of physical activity. So I think kind of going forward, a lesson learned for us would be, it would be more tailoring um, in the content. Right. And that's really good to hear. I think these are such great ideas and with amazing technology. So it's it's good to hear that feedback from studies that have already been done. Thank you. Anything in particular um, throughout your studies that you felt didn't go well that you would change in a future study? I'm sure there were things, but um, something in particular that comes to mind that might be helpful for researchers considering these types of studies? Um, so I think that, um, for, for one, I, I think I've said this to anybody that would listen, but however long you think you need to pilot these, pilot it longer than that. Um, uh, because it's definitely, you know, there's all sorts of glitches that come up. Ours, um, at one point we uh, learned that, um, and, and, and actually the only way that we kind of learned this was because I was a pilot, I was a pilot participant in this study for like two and a half years or something that it took to run. And one day I was like, God, I feel like I haven't like gotten it like many notifications in the past week. And we learned that like, a, you know, we'd used Care Evolution and we'd actually, Care Evolution had like reached the cap in terms of the number of notifications that AWS was allowed to send. And so only like 50% of the notifications were, were being sent. I think maybe something less than that. We estimated like half. So none of the participants were actually really getting many notifications, but there was like no way to tell who had gotten them and how many. And really like the only way that we ever figured out that it was happening and we're like therefore able to address it was like, just because I was in the study and like kind of like figured out that the um um you know the that uh the frequency didn't feel quite right. Uh, it was a short enough period. And right, we said like people were randomized over 70,000 times over the course of the study. And we were only talking about like a couple of weeks. Um, and so we we just kind of included the data under the intention to treat principle and um 
uh, you know, it, it was what it was. Um, but uh, this stuff definitely arises. Um, yeah, and I would add to that. I think so. Stuff breaks all the time, and especially when you're usually building the stuff with, you know, we're not an app development platform. Like we don't do that. It's not what we do every day. That's like that's what Facebook does. That's what you know these big companies do. We're a small, you know, uh, academic unit. So I think creating like recognizing that as a researcher and creating systems in place to like make sure it's working is really good. Like we create dashboards for most of our studies or some way that we can visualize data so that we know things are happening. Like, you know, every week we look at the number of push notifications that are sent for all of our participants in the study. And, and when people are in our study for longer than two weeks and haven't got a push notification, we're like, what's going on? Why aren't they getting any notifications? Um, and so there's little things like that you can do you know, to help people. We just I was just talking to a researcher that did a text-based text messaging study, 9,000 people over like two years. And I said to them, oh, how do you know the intervention worked? Do you know if anybody even got the text messages? Or And they said, we didn't even monitor it. We don't even know if they got any of them. And so I think that's something to just think about in, in technology research is like creating some mechanism to know if things were sent or, you know, some insanity checks for those things. Yeah, I think one of the challenges too, though, um, that I'll just say is you can tell when they were sent, but you can't always tell when they were received, um, which was kind of part of the challenge that we ran into because we could tell that our messages, um, they looked like they were sent, um, but um, there's, it was hard for us to tell that they weren't received. Um, there are a couple of ways to, to do that. So um, Pedja Klasna, who many of you may be familiar with his work if you're interested in JEDIs and MRTs, but one of his studies was Heart Steps, which was really one of the first studies. Um, and so he asked participants to acknowledge whether a text message or an app notification was received. So they had the option of like clicking a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, and so they could get that feedback then as to whether they actually received and when they received the notifications. Um, so um, it, it's a challenge. There, there are kind of different ways to think about addressing it. I'm letting the uncomfortable silence hang for those that are forming their question in their head. So I, I have a question kind of related. So we're working on an article that is kind of IRB considerations for, um, for studies with mobile devices. And some of the information that we're putting in is like being specific about participant expectations in, in the consenting process. So do you have any recommendations for like what specific things or maybe things you could have been more clear on during the consenting process or the study design process that might have helped? Um, we, so I don't know if there like would be any guidance. We give everybody um, kind of a, a study expectation, at least I know for the you know, studies that Mike and I have been involved in together for Valentine, we give them like a study expectations handout um, at the time of their um, consent or enrollment that kind of includes things like, we expect you to wear your watch this many times a day or during exercise sessions or, you know, whatever is relevant for your study, you know, it, it doesn't need to be kind of clouded in opacity. Like you can be like, this is physical activity intervention. We need to know when you're active. Right. Um, so, um, you know, we, we've tried to be upfront about that. We've um, linked expectations or incentives to things like wear time and, and adherence kind of like fairly generally, like, you know, if we tell people 10 hours a day and they're wearing their watch every day at eight hours, we're, we're not going to not give them their incentives. But if they don't wear their watch for like a month at a time, then, you know, that that, that type of thing. Um, and so we've, we've tried to like include that. Um, 
certainly kind of consents have told people about, you know, potential, you know, just charges related to text messages, if that's what they're getting, impact potentially on like, you know, battery life, things like that, that, that um, you know, while kind of like fairly minor, um, just kind of disclosing those up front. Um, I don't know, Mike, what you'd have to add. Yeah, I mean, I'd say the same same stuff, you know, the um, being clear with participants about what you're actually doing. I mean, the hard part about like location and things like that is kind of helping explain it to them in a way that they understand and making sure you're explicit with them about what you're doing with the information and that, you know, because people get, like was brought up earlier, they get a little bit um, sensitive about Big Brother and that kind of stuff. So um, just being explicit about that, uh, what you're doing. Okay. Any other questions? I actually had a question related to that when you were talking about uh, participant concerns with Big Brother, et cetera. Like it was great to hear how uh, receptive the participants were once they were in the study to their data being used and you know these custom tailorings. But did you have any questions or concerns at the recruitment level where you know? Once someone signs up, maybe those are people who are more willing to have their data be super tailored. Look, I'm giving you this. I want to get what's coming back. But um, in terms of people being willing to join in the first place, was that all a concern or specific questions that were repeatedly raised or I'm just curious? Yeah, I, I haven't heard about like someone making the decision yes or no to be in the study uh, based on that. But I have heard people. So like one of our the process when they go through to get enrolled is like they actually pull up the app, they log into the app. And when they log into the app, that's when a lot of the permissions get checked, right? Um, you guys probably had that happen to you when you download a new app and it says, do you want to receive push notifications? Yes or no. And, you know, geolocation or location services, yes or no. So that's when it usually hits them. And so we have had people that at that point ask more questions than, than they would have before, even though they went through a consent form um, and had it explained to them. Um, that when it kind of hits them that they're actually giving our app authorization um, to have access to that data. Um, I'm trying to remember, we've talked about it before, so there must have been some patient that might have not been a, like declined once they saw that information. Um, but it's not like a lot. I mean, if it was anybody, it was maybe one person that I remember. Great, thanks. Yeah, I would say for us, um, it, it seemed like it was, you know, I, I, we can't say for sure, but it, it, it seemed kind of like the minority. Um, so, you know, we enrolled, we, we approached everybody for, for Valentine specifically, we approached everybody as they were um, enrolling in cardiac rehabilitation. So that was about a thousand people in total. Um, we had kind of specific inclusion criteria around diagnoses and age. Um, so about 400 were eligible for the study and we, um, and we reached out to them and we enrolled 220. Um, so I, I think for a, a clinic, a randomized clinical trial to get that many people in, you know, and people not wanting to participate was for like a range of reasons. Um, but, but I, I think, you know, 220 of about 400 eligible people, um, um, I, I think is overall pretty, um, good in, in terms of enrollment. So certainly it was a concern, but, um, not, not by any means prohibitive and not the major majority. Now that you have experience with these types of studies and um, what kind of thoughts do you have about somebody that might be just starting out? Like <clears throat> a lot of times when we do consultations, the faculty members want to start really, really little. Like they might just want to do activity data from a watch without anything fancy just to get started. And if a if an investigator is thinking about this, how how might you um, talk to them about how they should scope the study or if they should really rein it in and keep it very small? 
I mean, from my standpoint, I, I think probably the biggest thing that that I run into when I talk to people about these types of studies is that they may not have a theory about what they're doing, right? They may just want to, like I had somebody come to me, this was two years ago and say, I have a bunch of people with diabetes and I want, we just want to give them a watch and like figure out what's going on. And I'm like, well, why do you want to give them a watch? Well, we want to get their steps. Well, why do you want to get their steps? And so the, I think the big thing is like trying to get at what is your theory? What do you want to use this data for? What is the the ultimate end goal? Um, and for Jedi's, it's really like, what is that piece that you want to intervene on? Where are they vulnerable so that you can do something to help them? And then that's where the research is, is like, is that the right time that they're vulnerable? Is it the right message when you when you find the right time when they're vulnerable? Is it the right message? And that's where MRT comes in is like trying to find the right message or the right context um for that person so that's that's kind of what i would say it's a little different for everybody i would think do you think it's a better approach to have fewer measures i mean if, if, given if the measures are um th they actually give them information that, you know, and they have a plan for the study, they have a goal for the study and they have objectives. Um, do you think that it's better to limit the number of data points that they're getting in types of data or not? Would you, because uh, that's one of the things they're like, I'd like these six things, but I'm going to go with just one, one to start with. I don't know, Jess, if you have an idea, but I think the more focused you can be early on, the better. I mean, I understand the concept of we want to collect these five or six things because we don't know which one's going to be the most important. So that's one piece that I think is important and people might want to do. But if you're deciding whether I want to watch, but I also want to watch a scale and a blood pressure cuff, you know, the more things you add on, the more complex it is. And so you have to sort of balance the you know, the difficulty of having more than one device and like, what's the most important thing? Do you think it's steps? Then I'd go with the watch. Do you think it's scale data? Then I'd go with the scale. So I think it depends on on the research. I, I agree with the idea of simplifying things, not making things too complex, for sure. Yeah, I agree. That's helpful. It sounds like it's it's more, the complexity obviously comes in with more devices, but multiple data types from the same device might be not complicate the study significantly. Yeah. Assuming that there's like a rationale for yeah. For collecting them. Yeah. That it makes sense for the what they're trying to what question they're trying to answer. All right. Well this has been really helpful. I appreciate the time you guys have taken um and we will be putting this up on the YouTube channel and I'm sure that there will be a lot of interest there. So thank you so much. And if I don't see you all, have a nice um, holiday break. <laughs>